Okay, and we are live. So, oh, let me let me switch on my camera so everyone in attendance can see, can see me. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I am Massimo Martelli, and I am a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy and the General Secretary of ISTVS. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this second event in our 2021 uh, digital event series. So uh, these events uh, take place on Wednesday, and we chose a time uh, to make it possible for all our international colleagues to attend. So midday in Europe, Africa, morning in North America, and evening uh, in uh, East Asia. And in this series, uh, we alternate weekly between informal student-led research uh, seminars uh, and lectures, uh, that is uh, our Terra Mechanics Bytes uh, by established researchers. And today uh, we are uh, kicking off our Terra Mechanics Bytes uh, with a lecture on uh, Terra Mechanics and Climate Change with particular reference to the UK uh, by Dr. Alex Keane. So before we start, uh, some quick information. So if you look um, at the, on the, the sidebar, on the right-hand side of your hopping page, you'll see a, session, uh, a section called Sessions. And in there, you'll find a chat uh, tab so I would like to invite uh, every one of you to, to use that tab to introduce yourselves. So uh, typing your name, affiliation, and research interests. And please, and please use the chat tab just for that purpose. Then uh, on the same section, you'll find another tab, another tab called Q&A uh, where you can instead type questions for our speaker. And so please uh, use that tab uh, to type your question. So uh, today the presentation will be around 45 minutes long. Uh, and at the end, we will have uh, five to 10 minutes of Q&A and open discussion. And with the possibility for those in attendance to be invited uh, to share their audio and video and join the live conversation. So now, that being said, I would like to officially introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Alex Keane, reading a short bio. So uh, Alex first became interested in environmental issues while an agricultural uh, engineering undergraduate at Newcastle University in the early 1970s. He was particularly influenced by the 1972 report uh, for the Club of Rome's project on the predicament of mankind, the limits to growth. He adapted the systems modeling approach used in this report to analyze nutrient and energy flows in agricultural systems for his master's of philosophy research. Interest in environmental sustainability cooled in the late 1970s, returning again in the 1990s and with greater urgency in recent years. He has also carried out Terra Mechanics research modeling traction, tires, suspension, and tractive efficiency. Currently, he is serving as UK National Secretary and Editor-in-Chief of the Resource Initiative for the ISTVS. So, Alex, you can take it from here. Right. Thank you, Massimo. I'll uh, share my screen and then carry on. And hopefully this will... Okay. 
welcome everybody to this Chain Mechanics Bike about ISGES new digital series events. This one is in the form of a lunchtime lecture for Europe Africa, a breakfast lecture for North America and an evening lecture for Asia Pacific. My lecture subject is how climate change affects what we do and the solutions to this problem that relate to care and mechanics. Many of the examples I use relate to what's happening in the UK, but they should relate more generally as well. So the title is Term Mechanics and Climate Change with particular reference to the UK. The slow increase in global average temperatures of around 1.4 degrees C since early industrial times, the mid 19th century, is becoming more noticeable in many parts of the world. But a more recent concern is the increasing number of extreme climate change events. Examples include the record heat waves in West North America and Australia with large jumps in maximum temperatures, such as the almost 50 degrees C in Western Canada. These are often followed with forest fires that endanger people and nature, destroying environments and leaving drought uh, landscapes behind. At the other extreme, higher temperatures above equatorial seas, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean and Pacific Rim, have led to more severe storms. This example is the bridge at Kansai Airport. Many of us crossed it when attending the 2018 Kyoto Conference. Not long after, it was hit by a destroying storm, as we can see in the uh, picture. High average global temperatures are leading to ice melt, particularly the Greenland ice sheet, which is melting at present faster than the Antarctic and the rate of ice melt is increasing. All this, although the sea rise rate is still relatively low, the effects can be seen, for example, the Mississippi Delta and lowland in Louisiana. Uh, this is becoming more invaded and eroded with rising water. Islands in the Pacific Ocean and even in the UK uh, in some coastal estuary. The cause of these events is now acknowledged as the burning of fossil fuels. The main aim of this lecture is to identify and consider aspects of terra mechanics that link to parts of the solutions for the climate change problem and to promote their discussion. It is useful to refer back to the ISTVS mission, which is published on the ISTVS website. The ISTVS mission is to advance the knowledge in terrain vehicle systems for improvements in engineering practice and for innovation in the terrain vehicle domain to promote the transfer of advanced knowledge to the user for the benefit of society at large in environmental protection, energy conservation and sustainable development. I've highlighted the keywords environmental protection, energy conservation and sustainable development. And also the keywords terrain vehicle systems. Hopefully the lecture is linking all of these keywords and I hope the overall keyword of importance is systems. It's very easy to become focused on small areas of research without always allowing for the overall systemic behavior of what's involved. It's important to stress that this lecture is only part of my point of view. Colleagues may wish to add to this, disagree, inform us of what they are doing or about their regional country. We invite further discussion and added content in the ISTVS Resource Initiative web pages for Environment, Climate Change and Terra Mechanics, ECCT. The lecture is divided into a short review of the climate change problem, the symptoms, analysis of the carbon cycle, the three main approaches to mitigating climate change and the targets proposed. 
ways to increase photosynthesis and to increase carbon sequestration, quantifying the scale of actions that need to be taken, peatland, forestry, and other demands from land, and implications for food, land use, and agriculture. The example of climate change in the UK, the specific challenges in comparison with other areas in the world, a simple food agriculture model for land use needs and to facilitate evaluating climate change mitigation. Terra mechanics and climate change, the use of renewable energy, soil, the main terrain considered in terra mechanics, soil management and terra mechanics. And finally, a summary of possible terra mechanics research linked to climate change. So firstly, a short review of the climate change problem, the symptoms, analysis of the carbon cycle, the three main approaches to mitigating climate change and the targets proposed. The climate change problem, the main indicators of the problem, the rise in global temperature is shown in figure one. After some cooler centuries, the global average temperature is shown increasing by the end of the 19th century and rising sharply by the end of the 20th century and start of the 21st century. Carbon, an essential part of all organic molecules, is found in the atmosphere and exchanged to it as, com as carbon compounds such as carbon dioxide and methane. The so-called greenhouse gases include carbon compounds such as carbon dioxide and methane. These compounds have an important role in regulating the Earth's temperature as heat is trapped by the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases also include water vapour, nitrous oxide and ozone. Greenhouse gases absorb and emit radiant energy within the thermal infrared range and their concentrations in the atmosphere have an important and necessary effect in regulating the Earth's temperature. Figure two shows the levels of carbon dioxide showing a similar pattern in increase since the 19th century. For the previous 2000 years, the levels have been relatively stable. Carbon dioxide levels, methane levels, nitrous oxide levels, and C uh, level rise uh, all show similar patterns. It's worth pointing out that the units for carbon dioxide levels are in parts per million. The units for methane and nitrous oxide are in parts per billion and the sea level rise is shown in centimetres. Figure two, global atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And figure six, global atmospheric oxygen levels. As carbon dioxide levels have increased, oxygen levels have decreased. This is an important effect on the relative rates of photosynthesis and respiration, part of the natural correction to stable global temperatures. The instability from increasing atmospheric carbon has come from the increase in atmospheric greenhouse gases, rising sharply by the end of the 20th century and start of the 21st century. If there is no action to stop or reverse the increase in global temperature, it is predicted that the rate of sea level rise will increase, along with increased weather instability and the seriousness of severe weather events. Warming temperatures also cause increased methane emissions from thawing permafrost. To evaluate the changes in atmospheric carbon, it is useful to have some understanding of the global carbon cycle. Carbon cycle provides a useful model for analyzing the carbon fluxes between the atmosphere, sea and earth and evaluating mitigating action at a global and country level. Figure seven is an example of published data for the carbon cycle. Blue shows the carbon pools, red shows the carbon fluxes, the units are on gigatons of carbon per year. The net balance of carbon to or from the atmosphere will result in an increase or decrease in the indicators in figures one to six. The amount of carbon stored in the deep and intermediate ocean is around 50 times that in the atmosphere. In the Earth's surface, in soil, it is about twice that in the atmosphere. And on the Earth's surface, as plants and trees, it is about three quarters that held in the atmosphere. 
The amount held in the ocean surface is similar to that held in the atmosphere. The largest fluxes are photosynthesis, which is slightly larger than the combined soil respiration and plant respiration at 120 gigatons of carbon per year. Ocean uptake, which is slightly larger than ocean loss at 92 uh, gigatons of carbon per year. Uh, there are also emissions to the atmosphere from deforestation, volcanoes, and burning fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels as around 7.7 .7 gigatons of carbon per year. Table one gives the carbon fluxes to and from the atmosphere that are shown in figure seven. Carbon losses from the atmosphere, photosynthesis and ocean uptake add up to 212 gigatons of carbon per year. Carbon emissions to the atmosphere, soil respiration, plant respiration, ocean loss, deforestation and land use change, volcanoes, adds up to 208.2 gigatons of carbon per year. There would be an inbuilt correction from this of lowering global temperatures as seen in past centuries, but burning fossil fuels adds another 7.7 .7 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere with net emissions at around 3.9 uh, gigatons of carbon per year. The net carbon emissions of 3.9 gigatons of carbon per year represents a net 0.52% annual increase in atmospheric mm -hmm. carbon levels. Measuring the data from the interactive internet source of figure one, the increase in carbon dioxide levels in figure one from 1996 to 2018 averaged 0.54% per annum, showing close agreement between the data in figure one and figure seven. Increased carbon dioxide concentrations appear to increase global photosynthesis compared to pre-industrial times. The cessation of burning fossil fuels may in itself cause an annual reduction of carbon dioxide concentrations by around 3.8 gigatons of carbon per year. This may reduce as the carbon dioxide concentrations or so for photosynthesis reduces over the years closer to pre-industrial levels when the emission and uptake of carbon dioxide appear to be close to each other with small annual variations. Substantially reducing the emissions of carbon from the use of fossil fuels would be a significant step towards reversing atmospheric carbon concentrations. Stopping burning fossil fuels would reverse the increase of carbon in the atmosphere. The largest carbon fluxes are the carbon fixed through photosynthesis and the carbon emissions through plant and soil respiration. Approaches to mitigating reducing carbon emissions. There are so far three broad approaches to mitigating climate change greenhouse gas emissions. One, switching to using renewable energy through solar, wind, hydrogen biomass, hydroelectric, wave power, geothermal, nuclear is becoming less of a preferred option. Solar panels provide flexibility on the size of installation from industrial scale to single panels. The panels on the roof of the farm building uh, shown around 280 square meters should provide enough electrical energy to operate a 100 horsepower tractor for 10 hours uh, a day at maximum power or a 100 kilowatt tractor operating at 75 percent of its maximum power for 10 hours a day. In the UK wind power now provides around 28 percent of electricity demand Mostly sea wind turbines, although land wind turbines are cheaper to install.
hydrogen fuel cells have the advantage that the hydrogen can be produced from renewable energy and the energy stored until required. As part of a hybrid power system, the battery requirement is significantly reduced. At present, solutions for larger on-road and off-road vehicles using hydrogen fuel cells look more likely. Biofuel from algae and uh, seaweed has the advantage that some of the carbon captured can be stored. The fuel energy can be stored and it allows the continued use of existing internal combustion engines with zero or negative net carbon emissions. Secondly, increase the efficiency in the use of energy, preferably renewable energy. For example, using less energy in heating buildings by using insulation and heat pumps, using less energy in farm operations. Also, manufacturing operations such as cement manufacture can be improved to significantly reduce emissions. Thirdly, changing land use, promoting vegetation, forestry and agricultural activity to store, sequestrate carbon, increase photosynthesis to increase plant, tree and soil storage of carbon and avoid carbon losses through deforestation and other changes in land use, promote peatland conservation and repair. Other environmental considerations include biodiversity, use of chemicals, food standards, food security. Environmental considerations such as flood mitigation, reducing soil erosion and promoting wildlife are also important considerations. These are now included in the development of UK agriculture and forestry policy. There are a large number of official reports in these areas. For example, the 2019 UN report on global sustainable development highlights growing concerns over climate change and biodiversity loss. And the World Wide Fund for Nature 2020 Living Planet Report highlights the loss of wildlife species in the last 50 years. The UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs Sustainable Development website provides considerable amount of advice as well. Reversing climate change may be possible. For example, a proposed 20% reduction in atmospheric carbon dioxide to about 350 parts per million, equivalent to 1980 levels, over 50 years, around 150 gigatons of carbon, is equivalent to about net capturing and storing three gigatons of carbon per year. Three possible ways to achieve this reduction are, one, reduce fossil fuel emissions to 0.8 gigatons of carbon per year and increase your renewable energy to 87% of current fossil fuel use. Two, stop carbon emissions due to deforestation and land use changes. Halve fossil fuel emissions and grow forests to store 1.8 gigatons of carbon per year. Three, stop carbon emissions due to deforestation and land use changes. Halve fossil fuel emissions and increase soil organic matter and soil inorganic carbon by 1.8 gigatons of carbon per year. In the UK, combinations of reducing the use of fossil fuels, growing trees, increasing soil organic carbon and other carbon sequestration measures are part of policy objectives and targets although much of the detailed action is still to evolve. The restoration of trees remains among the most effective strategies for climate change mitigation. Excluding existing trees, Baston and et al. have estimated there is room for an extra 0.9 billion hectares of canopy cover, which could store 205 gigatons of carbon in areas that would naturally support woodlands and forest. 
However, climate change will alter this potential. So the global potential canopy cover may shrink by around 223 million hectares by 2050, with the vast majority of losses occurring in the tropics. Allowing for a 50 year period for the forest to mature, this still exceeds the carbon storage in option two in the example above. The importance of mixed stands of trees natural to an area is often stressed for, for promoting biodiversity, wildlife and other ecological functions, as in the examples below. In option three, 1.8 gigatons per year evenly stored in the 37.8% of the Earth's agricultural surface is equivalent to increasing the soil organic matter in the top. 0.3 meters by 0.009% a year, or 0.46% over 50 years. Is this an achievable target? World land use can be divided into a few general categories, and of particular interest for climate change are agriculture and forestry. Agriculture and forestry make up about two thirds of world land area, with forestry at 30% and agriculture at 38%. Arable land makes up almost 11% of the world land area, and most of this land will be worked on and traveled over on an annual basis. It's important to note that world peatlands cover about 2.8% of the land area and this may include some agricultural and forestry use. Peatlands store approximately 415 gigatons of carbon, a similar amount to that stored in all the world's trees and forests and equivalent to more than one quarter of all soil carbon. Although peatlands are found in uh, equatorial areas such as uh, South America, uh, the Congo, Indonesia, most peatland is found in northern Asia, northern Canada, Alaska and northern Europe. Much of the northern peatland is frozen and is becoming very vulnerable to permafrost thaw. The BBC documentary, Climate Change the Facts, gave this data in global emissions by economic sector. After electricity and heat at 25%, agriculture, forestry and land use is the second largest contributor at 24%, transport 14%, industry 21%, buildings and other sources make up the difference. A large part of our terra mechanics interests are covered by agricultural, forestry, land use and transport. Environmental emission targets and roadmaps. Net zero emissions. Net zero essentially means contributing nothing to global warming. Carbon emissions to the atmosphere equal carbon absorbed from the atmosphere. If achieved, we are hoping for a halt to global warming not a reversal, which re would restore the equilibrium of several decades ago. Unfortunately, the term net zero seems to have become a cliche for promises or targets without clear action, which in the end may be in inadequate anyway. Have we passed or will we pass a point of irreversibility in climate change? Where do the international targets come from? COP stands for the Conference of the Parties. COP conferences are attended by countries that signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a treaty in 1994. COP3 held in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan adopted the Kyoto Protocol, which outlined the greenhouse gas emissions reduction obligation. 
COP21 held in 2015 in Paris, the Paris Climate Conference led to a new international climate agreement applicable to all countries aimed to keep global warming below 2 degrees C, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels, in accordance with the recommendations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. The COP25 meeting in mid Madrid finished with a number of issues unresolved, but an agreement was made about cutting carbon dioxide emissions. Each nation agreed to devise a plan by the 2020 COP26 conference in Glasgow to cut their carbon emissions. Due to COVID-19, COP26 has been postponed to November this year. The UK Climate Change Committee, CCC, which advises the UK government as reported extensively on the UK 2050 net zero target. The targets for each sector of the economy and although there is some guidance for national action, some government action and policy are still to be made and clarified. The climate change problem in the UK, mitigating carbon emissions. The UK Climate Change Committee published detailed data on the UK's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. This figure shows carbon dioxide equivalent per person per year for two years 2017 and 2030. The data is shown for the world, China, India, USA, EU and UK. Current position shows the UK close to the world average emissions per person with a substantial improvement predicted by 2030. The main greenhouse gas emitters on a per person basis will still be the USA and China. This figure shows annual emissions from the years 1990 to 2016 for the eight sectors, surface transport, industry, buildings, power, aviation, shipping, agriculture and land use, land use change and forestry, waste and lift gases. The main improvements in the UK have come from power, industry, buildings and waste agriculture, land use, land use change and forestry in green have made a smaller contribution to reducing emissions. The Climate Change Committee has made predictions for 2050 greenhouse gas emissions in the core scenarios compared to 1990 and 2017. Uh, our main interest is likely to be in agriculture and forestry, so we'll just concentrate on that area. The UK Climate Change Committee 2019 Net Zero Greenhouse Gas Scenario for Land Use and Agriculture. Land use, this focuses on afforestation and peatland restoration. Agriculture, this focuses on healthier diets, reduced food waste, tree growing and low carbon farming practices. Co benefits from all the uh, scenarios due to improved air quality, healthier diets, more walking and cycling, green growth, and industrial opportunities. Much of the detail is still to be determined, although the government is trying to introduce an environmental land management ELM scheme, which encourages farmers and landowners to do public good for public funds. For example, for increasing soil carbon or organic matter and for increasing biodiversity. The UK has less than 0.9% of the world's population and not including the British Overseas Territories, the UK area is less than 0.18% of the world's land area. On either a population or a land area basis, the UK contribution to mitigating global greenhouse gas emissions will be relatively small. 
but as a major economy on a total gross domestic product GDP or GDP per person basis, and as a member of the G7 Economic Council, in actions to combat climate change are important, particularly as the UK has one of the highest population densities of the countries with developed economies. Agricultural, arable and forestry land use for the world, UK and Europe. UK has a high density of 257 people per square kilometer. This is around five times greater than the world average and about eight times greater than the European average. 73% of the uh, land is used in agriculture. This compares to 38% for the world and 22% for Europe. And this reflects in 12% of the land down to forest compared to 30% for the world and 45% for Europe. Looking at the demand of land for food, compared to the rest of Europe, the UK has a high percentage of agricultural land, a low percentage of forestry and a high level of food imports, at least 40%. Countries that import food have been seen as exporting part of their climate change emissions problem. One way to investigate the use of land is to model the national needs for agricultural production and identify and quantify how agriculture, forestry and other land use can contribute solutions to the climate change problem. A simple food land model for the UK. Population 66.5 million. The diet is assumed to be cereal based. Food energy, 2,250 calories per day per person. Production potential from the five grades of UK land is considered and grades two to three is used. Crop land and production required comes out at 13.6% of UK land at five tonnes per hectare. The land left for grass and animal production and forestry comes from grade five, four and some grade three. At present, a considerable area of land is used for growing grain for animal production, a major cause of the more than 40% food imports. The simple model suggests that a diet with less meat could significantly reduce the agricultural land required for self-sufficiency allowing more land to be used for forestry and carbon sequestration. Terra mechanics and climate change. Land use is heavily driven by agriculture in the UK. Agriculture uses 73% of land in the UK versus 22% in Europe versus 38% in the world. As stated, there are so far three broad approaches to mitigating climate change greenhouse gas emissions. For approach one, switching to using renewable electric energy, hydrogen and biomass. In the UK, locally produced solar and wind energy are quite feasible. Hydrogen solutions and uh, algae biofuel solutions are probably slightly less feasible in the shorter term. It's worth remembering that a lot of vehicle solutions have been tried before. The first hybrid car built was by Ferdinand Porsche back in 1899. It used a gasoline engine instead of a battery pack and it supplied power to two electric motors in the front wheels. This 1959 Alice Chalmers farm tractor uses fuel cells. The tractor was equipped with 1,008 individual cells and could haul 3,000 pounds. The output was 15 kilowatts of electricity.
This more modern deer tractor can deliver 174 horsepower of continuous power and run for four hours on a three hour battery charge. John Deere are also developing autonomous tractors and the market is projected to reach around 50,000 units by the year 2027. Although the source doesn't indicate what the makeup of the units will be, types of autonomous farm equipment include driverless tractors, agricultural drones, and unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, agricultural robots, and autonomous harvesters. New hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicles are being developed. This New Holland hydrogen fuel cell tractor, NH2, this information was from a number of years ago, and it's not quite clear what's actually happened to the vehicle. Uh, Mercedes are testing fuel cell lorries, and uh, in this example, uh, the lorry is using two 150 kilowatt fuel cells uh, with additional batteries. So this type of unit could possibly be used in uh, agricultural, larger agricultural vehicles as well. Terra mechanics and climate change, cultivation, soil health, and organic carbon. The use in the UK of large diameter, low pressure front tires and rear rubber half tracks to provide low sinkage and low slip traction at high tractive efficiency is now common. There is in the UK a trend towards less ploughing and more minimum tillage and the focus should probably move from traction to tractor efficiency and efficiency of cultivation operations. The top example shows a single pass machine with a combination of tines, discs and a roller prior to drilling. The lower example uh, shows minimum tillage and drilling combined in one pass. Although there has been considerable research into tines, discs, rollers, uh, soil cutting, there has been little modelling of cultivators combining several different soil manipulation processes. Minimum tillage, or min-till, also called conservation tillage, reflects the intention to reduce tillage compared with ploughing systems. Unlike, unlike ploughing, minimum tillage is a tillage method that does not invert the soil and has the goal of minimizing the soil manipulation necessary for successful crop production. Strip tillage extends the idea further and inter-row cropping with legumes to provide nitrogen and increase soil organic matter provides a further challenge. Precision planting techniques, such as those used in the system of rice intensification, which entail wider row spacing, are options to explore. More recently, Concerns over the loss of carbon from ploughed and bare fields has brought into question the use of ploughing where it can be avoided. The main limitation with minimum tillage methods is that, is that they often rely on the use of herbicides to control weeds. The potential use of wider rows, inter-row cropping of legumes and precision mechanical weed control is still to be evaluated. The efficiency of much of the use of cultivation techniques and agronomy and organic matter management is still unknown. We focus on the mechanics and the performance of agricultural tractors carrying out field cultivations, including implement forces, force transfer between tractors and implements, real and virtual hitch points, traction prediction and the determination of tractor efficiency using two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive and how a control or field management strategy can be implemented to maximize tractive efficiency. There's poor availability of modern tractor field performance data in the public domain, and aspects such as the dynamic variation of weight transfer and weight addition from ground working implements to tractors are not fully documented or evaluated in published research. The development of electric power tractors and the move to more precision minimum tillage provides a major opportunity for terra mechanics research and the mechanics and the performance of these agricultural tractors carrying out field cultivations. How will the change to electric power and drives affect the control and delivery of energy to soil engaging processes? The focus on carbon capture and storage requires a more 
sophisticated view of soil properties and behavior, the measurement and evaluation of the cultivation process before and after the tractor pass requires sophisticated instrumentation, requiring real-time spectroscopy and evaluation of the long-term effects on soil organic matter. Soil. Soil has been the main terrain type dealt with terra mechanics and historically a main terra mechanics concern has been the engineering properties of soil strength, mechanical properties, the effect of moisture, particularly those properties that affect vehicle mobility, soil cutting and manipulation. More recent concerns with climate change are highlighting soil ecological services, its ability to absorb and store carbon, its ability to resist erosion and its ability linked to surface vegetation to hold water for reducing and managing flooding and its ability to grow food in an environmentally sustainable way. Hibblewhite et al have stated that the major challenge within sustainable soil management is to conserve ecosystem service delivery while optimizing agricultural yields. They propose that soil health is dependent on the maintenance of four major functions, carbon transformations, nutrient cycles, soil structure maintenance, and the regulation of pests and diseases. Mitigating climate change through carbon sequestration and improving agricultural yields are mutually supportive Increasing soil organic matter is one of the ways to improve soil health and fertility. At a practical level, the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board has been developing a soil health scorecard for common indicators, pH, routine nutrients, bulk density and penetrometer resistance, less common indicators, visual evaluation of soil structure, soil organic matter loss on, ign on ignition, respiration and earthworms, new indicators, total nitrogen, microbial biomass carbon, potentially mineralizable nitrogen, DNA measures, e.g. pathogens, nematodes and microarthropods. Techniques such as real-time near-infrared spectroscopy have made major steps forward in the data collection and processing of soil analysis. Further thermomechanics research opportunities that follow from the UK Climate Change Committee recommendations. The development of soil related mechanisation with a prime aim of improving soil health and increasing soil carbon content, particularly soil organic carbon content. Precision cultivation techniques and precision weed control using the potential of automation, robotics and artificial intelligence in situ and on machinery sensors to monitor and control performance and management decisions. The use of winter legume cover crops, strip cultivation methods, interrow planting, spring cereals, etc. Spring wheat with a prior overwinter cover crop of legumes, clover, reduces fertilizer leaching over winter and reduces the need for for nitrogen inorganic fertilizer. Incorporated as a green manure, legumes promote carbon storage. Also for the farmer, the disincentive may be lower yields, but spring cereals are more likely to benefit from precision sowing methods. The use of electric powered machinery and prime movers, tractors, loaders, harvesters, etc. For terra mechanics, this supports the development of electric powered vehicles using renewable energy, including the development of drive lines, wheel drives, and their control. The potential to increase photosynthesis levels from agricultural cropping and forestry, soil management potential for carbon storage and sequestration, the significance of soil erosion on the loss of, of soil carbon. The potential to increase photosynthesis levels from agricultural cropping and forestry, soil management potential for carbon storage and sequestration, the significance of soil erosion on the loss of soil carbon, peatland restoration. There are proposals from the UK Climate Change Committee recommendations for peatland restoration. This could provide some term mechanics challenges. Much of the UK peatland is around and even below sea level. 
the risk of carbon peatland erosion to the sea is high as sea levels rise. Forestry, an increase in the global area of trees has emerged as one of the major mitigating strategies. The increased global profile of environmental protection of forestry terrain, automated planting and harvesting, and forest management should provide increased mechanic, terra mechanics research opportunities. This will include forestry systems that maximize carbon capture, maintain biodiversity, minimize soil erosion and soil damage, and improve flood control. Utility vehicles, increased weather uncertainty and increased occurrence of flooding and terrain and infrastructure damage will require development on specialist manned and autonomous vehicles for disaster relief. The demand and economic importance for smart service vehicles to service and install land and sea renewable energy installations should increase. Controlled traffic farming. Uncontrolled traffic in fields has been shown to lead to the majority area of the field being traversed by wheels in a crop production year. An aim of controlled traffic farming, CTF, is to ensure that during mechanised operations, wheel travel takes place in the same wheelings, thus reducing the potential of soil compaction damage affecting crop growth. This can be achieved by matching wheel widths for vehicles and trail machines. The spacing of tracks is often determined by the width of harvesters. The repeated use of the tracks leads to compacted high strength soil with a high coefficient of traction if required and low rolling resistance. Because the crop growing area has minimum dis disturbance from machinery, the soil structure and drainage improve, reducing the crop risk during drought and heavy rainfall. There is a good iAgri lunchtime lecture on YouTube by Tim Chayman on controlled traffic farming. Examples of new UK agriculture. Paludiculture. This combines reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from peatland through rewetting with continual land use and biomass production. Regenerative agriculture focus on topsoil regeneration and health in increasing biodiversity, improving the water cycle and increasing resilience to climate change. Conservation areas. There's an increase in the use of conservation areas around the edges of fields and even through the middle of fields uh, to promote biodiversity and uh, wildlife and particularly to promote uh, uh, pollinating insects such as bees. A question from me, can we design small terra mechanics robots to look after small scale organically farmed plots? Many individual farmers in the UK and around the world are embracing ideas and change for a long-term sustainable environment for which a clear acceptance and path need to be shown. Other considerations such as biodiversity, use of chemicals, animal welfare, wildlife, availability, and use of fresh water, flooding, etc., also need to be included when considering the environmental impact of what is done. Two last examples. The one on the left is the restoration of wetlands, and the one on the right is the use of clover as a winter cover crop. Conclusions. A combination of a switch to the efficient use of renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon capture and storage using trees and soil organic matter is becoming a major part of the accepted approach to mitigating climate change. The biggest action to reverse climate change is to stop burning fossil fuels. The use of biofuels from algae may produce hydrocarbon fuels that have a net zero carbon emission value. These biofuels may extend the lifetime use of already existing IC engines, and also they do not compete for the use of high value farming land. 
Other areas where term mechanics can help mitigate the effects of climate change include electric vehicle technology will quickly dominate new vehicle sales and already are in some areas requiring research in off-road vehicle drives and designed to match electric power and changing demands. Recharging of battery technology are important. Hydrogen fuel cells are likely to become an important part of hybrid vehicle technology, particularly as part of energy storage and saving weight batteries and recharging time. More research is required on how off-road vehicles will interact with soil and promote its carbon content through crop operations, more land greening, precision automated operations, and vehicle management, such as controlled traffic farming that limit terrain surface damage. The performance of minimum tillage cultivations and tractor performance needs more study. The use of artificial intelligence and automation allows the use of small driverless vehicles with low axle weights to carry out precision sensing and weed and pest control. It is necessary to consider soil health in a wider perspective rather than primarily its soil strength and compaction properties. The further development of in situ, real time and remote sensing to monitor and manage soil health is needed, particularly the use of spectroscopy to measure and log soil properties. Forestry and an increase in the global area of trees has also emerged as one of the major mitigating strategies. The increased global profile of environmental protection of forestry terrain, automated planting and harvesting, and forest management should provide increased terra mechanics research opportunities. Peat restoration conservation has emerged as one of the major mitigating strategies <laughs> and improved peat rewetting and peat management in agriculture, leisure and wild areas is important. Managing thawing permafrost may become a major issue that relates to terra mechanics, vehicles and machinery to support coastal protection and coastal carbon capture and storage, see grass, could become important. There are hard decisions to be made about food security and diet, land use and environmental objectives. How land is managed and used as a multi-use resource should be part of research objectives in terra mechanics when terrain management is considered. There is considerable scope for more research, particularly of a more multidisciplinary nature involving engineering, soil science, agronomy and forestry. Agriculture industry business groups, such as the UK National Farms Union, have already set more demanding net zero carbon emission targets than the national government, and more demanding targets of reducing atmospheric greenhouse gas levels close to pre-industrial levels are also argued for. Increasing numbers of land managers are developing environmentally sustainable practices, including biodiversity and nature generally. Science will have to respond quickly to help achieve timely progress. There are several areas I would have liked to have looked at in more detail, including restoring peatland and managing thawing permafrost. Uh, but there are ISTVS members who know more about this than I do, and we would like to hear from them and add content to the resource initiative pages around this subject. As much as me answering questions next, I would be as interested in hearing the audience's views around opportunities for terra mechanics for climate change mitigation, what is happening in their part of the world, funding opportunities, etc. Thank you for patiently listening. Okay, Alex, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. And uh, before jumping to our actual uh, Q&A and live discussion uh, part of this event, uh, just for the fun of it, I would like to share with all of you uh, the registration stats uh, for today. 
So out of the 25 regist total registrations we had, we have a bulk uh, from South Africa leading at eight. So they are the winners of our friendly competition here and congratulations and runner up United States with five, two people from UK and then uh, one for, uh, from a set of different countries, including Australia, Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, and Italy. And uh, well, I have to say, I'm very glad to see uh, people uh, registering from all time zones, from, from the West to the East. So, and, and seeing quite a decent decent registration figures and attendance figures uh, i would say for our uh, brand new series and um, i would just uh, like to remind you that now you have two options to participate to to the discussion uh, you can either type your questions in the q a tab uh, as we have already said at the beginning of this stream uh, and I see that some uh, questions are already in, and then I'll I'll leave I'll leave it to to Alex to be to begin uh, answering those questions. But also, uh, you have the possibility to join us live on screen to ask your question and to share your thoughts and and make make your comments. So, in this latter case, which we strongly encourage. Uh, all you have to do is click on the share audio and video button and a moderator will approve it and let you in. So, so please uh, keep, uh, keep asking questions and please uh, join us here, here live on screen. Thank you, Alex. Now I'll leave it to you for the actual <laughs> Q&A part. <laughs> Okay, thank you, uh, Massimo. Um, I had a quick look at the uh, the question tab, and um, I think Carl Becker, if Carl is still there, he uh, he probably asked the first one, and he was asking what the effect of the 2020 COVID shutdowns would have been on emissions. And uh, I unfortunately I don't have quantitative data, but it was widely reported at the time that the lack of use of vehicles improved air quality and uh, uh, some people heard a great deal more wildlife like bird song for the first time and uh, they felt that was a, a large improvement in their quality of life. Unfortunately, since then, traffic, certainly here in the UK, has almost returned to what it was before and uh, um, a lot of those benefits that we did have, including the clean air, seem to have actually gone backwards. But um, uh, if, if I don't know if Carl is still there, but he would like to join us. Um, we'd be pleased to see him. Uh, and uh, I think a second one was um, Ray Kruger was asking um, if there were papers that would justify uh, fundamental research in terra mechanics, um, uh, how that would um, be justified with uh, uh, climate change. Uh, to a, I hope to a certain extent that some of that was that was an early question. So I, I hope that some of that was answered in the, the later parts of the um, uh, uh, of the presentation. Uh, if if you remember, one of the slides showed um, uh, my, my analysis of a, a tractor system with uh, uh, its effects on soil, uh, its attractive attractive efficiency performance, and so on. And um, that sort of research has not been done a great deal. It's tending to take elements of terra mechanics, fundamental research, like traction, tractive efficiency, uh, force analysis, and so on, and then trying to combine those into a whole uh, vehicle model in it, the way it's interacting with the environment. The areas where we have not a great deal of knowledge is what the effects of um, what you're doing to the soil in terms of compaction, cutting it, turning it over, uh, whether those uh, uh, operations are affecting uh, the long-term effect on carbon uh, storage, uh, losses, etc., within the soil. Um, so uh, generally, I think there's probably quite a lot of sitting down of thinking 
to see how those things will link up and and possibly trying to sort of find uh, more fundamental research which has got more relative purpose with the actual problems that we're trying to solve at present climate change is not uh, a you know decades long activity it's something uh, i think most people would agree we have to find solutions quickly so we're not looking at starting a, a, a research program over 15 years to try and uh, find something about sort of uh, cutting soil or something. We're looking at trying to use the information that we already have and trying to apply it to solve problems that need to be solved within five or 10 years. I don't know if that helps, uh, Ray. Uh, if you want to join us, you're, uh, uh, you're welcome. Um, have we got any more? We've got another one from uh, bon, uh, Bongani. What is the consensus in industry on using biofuels to come combat climate change? To use natural habitats converted to well, the natural habitats um, is uh, I think that was one of the points that I'd like to try and sort of make. Uh, a lot of biofuel up to now, uh, including in North America, has been at the expense of good farming land. So in other words, farmers have been encouraged to instead of growing, say, maize for food, they've been growing maize uh, for um, uh, fuel, biofuel. Uh, and that means that there is less land for food, the cost of food goes up, and it also causes lots of problems uh, in terms of sort of monoculture and so on. But uh, the examples I was using of algae and seaweed don't compete for Good quality land for food and in fact it's quite easy if you think about it there is a lot there may well be a lot more salt water around in 15 to 20 years time and a lot of that salt water could be used uh, in coastal areas uh, and transported to barren areas where it could be used for promoting seaweed which could be used as a fuel i know at present there are some experiments off the california coast where there are experiments of farming sea uh, weed underground. Uh, and in the UK, there is quite a lot of interest in seagrass, which can store, uh, surprisingly, maybe up to 25 times the amount of carbon uh, that uh, 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 crops such as forests and so on can store. So the use of seaweed and seagrass for storing uh, carbon and recycling it uh, looks as though it may be quite promising. There's plenty of seaweed um, sorry, there's plenty of sea around, salt water uh, as a resource, and there is plenty of uh, waste products from uh, human activity, which can be used as a feed uh, for uh, for the plants. The same applies to algae. Uh, the the uh, image that I used was uh, the sort of thing that oil companies have been doing, particularly in the States, of investigating algae as a potential replacement for fossil fuels. The main reason that they don't follow it up is largely because of profit and cost. Uh, and if you then add in the extra benefits of um, reducing emissions and also possibly using some of the carbon say to, to, to add to land in storage, you can end up with uh, collecting carbon out of the atmosphere, putting some of that back into fuel um, so that the uh, carbon emissions are less than net zero or net zero and some of the carbon can also be used as land improvement. So in some areas, it could be well possible to use algae and seaweed and to try and improve soils and uh, the long-term uh, fertility of, of, of ground areas. Probably a slightly longer answer than I was uh, expecting. So uh, I think that's the last one we've got uh, on here. So oh. is there any other questions or anyone who would like to join us? Well, while we wait, hopefully, for someone to uh, to join us, uh, I'll go ahead and ask ask a question myself. Uh, you uh, you showed several references on your uh, on your presentation. Is there uh, an organized and comprehensive list of those references uh, made available for all those that are interested in this in this topic? Um, yeah, most of the information uh, that I've uh, used in this presentation has come from my Canada conference uh, uh, paper, the Canada conference in September. Uh, and quite a lot of the um, 
topics which I picked, there is actually rather more detail in the paper than I would have been able to include in the presentation. Uh, most of that is referenced either by name or number or both. Uh, so what I can do is use the reference list uh, from the paper and put that into the resource initiative area of the climate change uh, and terra mechanics uh, pages. And those numbers should uh, match up with the numbers and the names uh, uh, that I've used in the presentation. So the answer is yes. We have a, 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 we have a, um, a, a reference list, and I'll put it on the resource initiative pages. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. And OK, so I see someone is joining us. Joining us on stage, I see Mohit. Please, Mohit, uh, welcome. So uh, I, I had one question. So you in the presentation, it was um, the importance of organic soil carbon was highlighted. So yes. could you um, also tell us about the relevance and like possibilities of uh, increasing inorganic soil carbon? Okay. Um, well, I'm not uh, much of a soil scientist, although I did do uh, a little bit of soil science at university many years ago. Uh, but uh, most of the um, soil that we're, the carbon we're adding is in the form of organic material, so it's organic soil carbon. But there is also inorganic uh, uh, carbon in uh, soil. And um, there are various ways that can be added. One of them is using what's called biochar. Now, biochar is almost, uh, and, well, it is an abbreviation for biological charcoal. And um, some of you may have actually seen in uh, the countryside um, people who make charcoal. Sometimes it's on an industrial level. When I was very young, uh, back in the 1950s, we used to have people who went around the woods and they actually made charcoal and then sold it for cooking and so on. Uh, and essentially, uh, if you take organic material, um, and uh, better still, if you've got wood, any wood will do, and you um, basically cook it in a closed container so that there is no air, uh, charcoal makers used to pile the wood up and then plaster mud or clay around it so that uh, the oxygen couldn't get into it. So if you cook wood, uh, then you end up effectively with charcoal and byproducts. Uh, byproducts will include some carbon dioxide, but obviously a lot less carbon than there is in the wood or organic material you start with, and also some uh, other sort of, uh, almost you might call it contaminants, uh, uh, which may need to be disposed of in various ways, but that would be a small quantity. So effectively it's charcoal, and charcoal, if you add that to the soil, can last for a very long time before it is degraded and ends up uh, uh, going into the uh, atmosphere. So it's one of the ways. So for example, if you, in this country, we're now being encouraged, or landowners are now being encouraged to grow trees. So when these trees get larger, what are they gonna do with them? One of the things they might do with them is to actually turn the trees into charcoal if the price of wood is not very good. And then they'll get paid for putting the charcoal into the ground to increase the carbon content of the ground. So the ELM uh, scheme, which I mentioned in the, in the presentation, the Environmental Land Management Program, which our government is now using to support farmers and landowners, it's in an early stage. Uh, but it will be encouraging farmers to grow trees and landowners to grow trees. It will also be encouraging farmers and landowners, landowners to increase the carbon content of the soil. And one of the easiest ways to do that if you grow trees is to turn the trees into charcoal, produce biochar and add that to the soil. And it will have a certain amount of benefit uh, from a fertility point of view as well as starting, uh, storing more carbon. So um, that uh, is one of the sources of inorganic, inorganic uh, soil carbon. There are others, but uh, um, uh, they're probably less uh, less of a topic at the moment to, to go into. Okay. 
Thank you, Mohit. And uh, well, I see, well, we have a lot of people still on the stream and I see, I see Skalk. Hello, Skalk. <laughs> uh, would you like, would you like to join us on screen? We would really like to, to have, to have a chat with you if, <laughs> if you're willing to, to do so. Of course, we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to force you. And um, I also saw that um, another question was typed in the in the chat. Oh, I see Skulk coming on. Oh, hello, hello, Skulk. <laughs> hello, can can, can you hear me? See you. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, we can no, see good. you and hear you. Uh, uh, I don't have a specific question, but I, I just want to make a comment and. Uh, 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 the paper that you presented today, Alex, is not what we would normally expect uh, as part of theory mechanics, but I think it's an eye-opener. Um, I really uh, enjoyed the, the presentation and the content because it forces uh, our researchers that are often get stuck in our little bits of our own space to just think of what the implications of what we do are in, in the bigger context. So I, I think it's really nice uh, uh, to just get this different perspective um, and also sensitize us that uh, uh, we must always keep the reason why we do things uh, into uh, keep that into consideration. It's, it's not about soil or about um, tractors or equipment or clean energy. It's, it's about uh, creating a sustainable environment for all of us to for, for, for the long term. Um, and uh, whatever we do uh, in research should always keep that goal in mind, is that we are trying to make for the better world uh, and the safer world and the more efficient. So thank, thank you for, the, for this. Um, also, involved of ICTA is for many years. Thank you also for, for, to all of you who, who drive this initiative um, it's one of the things that uh, you, you'll see the number of people from from africa or from south africa uh, from my side i've uh, encouraged my team to uh, really join this effort i think it's a great effort it's a very important effort and we really hope that uh, that the message will spread and more people will uh, will join this and and then interact i think it's really important for the society but also for our own uh, personal uh, development and broadening of perspectives. So thank you very much for, for this effort. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Skalk, for, for joining us and, uh, and for your nice comment. And I just realized uh, I called you up on stage and I didn't, I didn't do a proper introduction. So for those of you who are not familiar with him, uh, Professor Skalk Els is professor at the University of Pretoria. Uh, South Africa, responsible for the Vehicle Dynamics Group, and he is also Deputy uh, General Secretary of the ISTVS uh, for Europe Africa. So, uh, thanks again, Skalk, for for joining us on uh, on stage today and give us this nice uh, ending to <laughs> to our Q discussion session. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, just a, a, a question, Scott. Uh, in, in your area, which obviously um, there's a lot of wildlife and uh, um, nature around you, do you see um, very many changes in recent years from, from either increasing temperatures or changes in weather patterns? Is that something people are particularly aware where you are or, or are you in a more sort of slightly sheltered area? Um, Alex, it's an interesting question because up to end, we would have agreed with a whole climate change, a global warming thing, because we su were supposed to be in the middle of winter, but mm. we had minimum temperatures of 8 to 10 degrees and maximums of 21 to 25, so it was warm. But yesterday, mm. a cold front struck us, so for the first time this winter, we saw zero <laughs> I even think minus one degree Celsius. So I think the, the world is, is back to about normal. Uh, 
But yes, up to last week, I believe the, the, our temperature was definitely significantly higher than, than previously. But, uh, so is it becoming more variable? Are you seeing more highs and lows? Yes, I, that, I, uh, I, I do. It's not warming, it's, it's climate change. So we definitely yeah. see uh, some, some years mm -hmm. much warmer than years. So that change is, is evident. Uh, so South Africa is, from an agricultural perspective, uh, are, are basically uh, a large part of our country is is arid. Uh, it's it's dry. Uh, the rainfall where we live in Betora is about 600 millimeters per year. Uh, don't know how many is, but in in inches, about uh, 24. 240, yeah, 24, 24. So most people will say you can't you can't farm. Uh, you can't do dry land farming. Um, so, so we are most most of our country, very, very large part of our country, is not agriculture friendly from from that point of view. And we also um, don't have large numbers of large vegetation, large huge forests. Uh, so um, it's it's difficult to say um, what the real long term um, effects will be on on us. Yeah, I mean We're some of the. Some of the images we've seen from Australia in uh, last year, uh, with the damage the, to um, uh, the, the heat waves and then the, the forest fires, and we're seeing yeah. the same again in Western North America. That really is looking quite frightening, and it looks as though because we're relatively early in the in the uh, the, the forest fire season, uh, it looks as though that may even get worse uh, over the coming weeks. So. That really is yeah. a bit of a worry because if if uh, the I think the the maximum temperatures in Canada they jump something like four degrees, so mm. if we get any more events like that, and in, uh, unless people have got uh, uh, air conditioning, it's going to be a very very difficult uh, uh, place to live mm. at certain so times think, of the year. Yeah, so I think the message is clear: the world has a problem, and and we have to. Um, rethink everything we rethink our own personal decisions where we travel uh, how we travel what we do mm. uh, what we research especially, especially yeah, as part of we must refocus our research and do things that are really uh, really important not nice to us but things that uh, Consider spending more effort on things that can really make a difference, that can really change, and not only produce papers, but produce ideas and concepts that we can implement and and help uh, mitigate the situation. Yeah, we we've got a major report coming out tomorrow uh, on advice and what we should be eating for the next uh, uh, decade. So. Uh, that may impact quite a lot of people, I don't know, but uh, we'll have to see what they come up with. Okay, okay good. good. So it looks like uh, we are getting to the end of the of the time uh, we have allocated for for today. So so before uh, uh, before thank you, Skalk. Yeah, thank you, thank you again, Skalk. So be before uh, we wrap this up, I would like to. Uh, sorry, let me let me reactivate uh, my screen share just for a second. And so uh, I would like to thank again Alex for his great lecture and all the staff at ISTVS that is contributing to make these events possible. And of course, uh, every one of you attending today and providing. Uh, your insight, your questions, and your comments. And uh, before we all go, please, please allow me two more minutes for for, uh, for some final announcements. Uh, so, um, on the website that you see uh, that you see here on screen, uh, you can find all the information you need on our upcoming events in the series. So you can find schedule, speakers, uh, and registration links for all, all the events in the series. And the page is being constantly updated, so please keep keep an eye on it. And um, uh, next, 
uh, next week on July tw uh, Wednesday, July 21st, uh, we are having our second student. Uh, so sorry, let me go back here. Uh, so we are having our second student research seminar. And as you can see, we have uh, four more scheduled for August, August and September. So uh, I would like to invite all the student research groups out there uh, to join us in this initiative and consider being our next speakers. And to, uh, so you can take advantage of this opportunity to give, uh, provide an informal look uh, at your research work. And if you are interested, as I hope, uh, please uh, email me uh, at this uh, email address over here. That's gs at istvs.org and we'll arrange to get you in the schedule and once again i really i really strong i really strongly encourage any student research group out there to to consider this uh yeah just a quick thank you massimo to uh you and jenna mm -hmm. and to moet for all the work you've done on getting all this underway mm -hmm. and the uh the help in in actually getting me onto the screen and pressing the right buttons so thank you for all that effort as well well, thank you. It was it was my my pleasure and our pleasure to do so, and I think we we did a nice event. So I'm very very satisfied about it. And to conclude uh, to conclude our announcement on on Wednesday, July twenty eighth, uh, at the same time as today, uh, we are having our uh, second. Uh, Terra Mechanics Byte uh, with the title Terra Mechanics uh, Models uh, for Lunar and Planetary Rovers. The lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Luth Richter, Richter uh, and it's going to be a good one. So uh, make sure you subscribe to, the, to this one as well. And finally, as you know, uh, this series of events uh, besides being um, its own thing, is also our build-up to the ISTVS conference that is taking place for the first time online this year, from September 29 to uh, sorry, from September 27 to September 29, and at the link that you can see on screen, conference.istvs.org, uh, you can find all the information you need. And one quick note, uh, early bird registration rates end tomorrow, July 15th. So if you, have, if you haven't registered yet, please hurry up to get uh, your discounted rate. And now I think that's, that's, really, uh, that's really it. So I, once again, I would like to thank uh, every one of you and see you soon at our next uh, event and at the conference in September, of course. Right, Thanks thank again, you. everyone. Cheers, everyone. All right, thank you, Massimo.